Our episodes deal with serious and often distressing incidents. Listener discretion is advised. Before we kick off today's episode, I just wanted to ask whether you had ever heard of Fruit of the Bean Coffee. They are an American whole bean roasted coffee company with a purpose. Matt K regularly drinks whole bean coffee before sitting down to edit the scripts and do the audio production. He loved their Costa Rica single origin beans and said it's easily the best coffee he's ever had and he's tried them all. The coffee arrives super fresh because they don't roast your beans until after you've ordered. And not only do Fruit of the Bean supply awesome coffee, but 10% of all of their net income goes to supporting orphans and those affected by human trafficking. Their owner Josh knows that in times of need, America needs coffee. That's why all of Fruit of the Bean's coffee range will be 20% off throughout this crisis until most companies in America are back on their feet. To access this offer, just go to their website www.fruitofthebean.com and the discount will be automatically applied. That's fruitofthebean.com. Drink coffee, do good. In the early 1800s, the so-called enlightened classes were in the process of establishing Edinburgh as the Athens of the North. The city itself was ripe for such a title, with natural beauty in its peaks and valleys and lying perched against the remnants of an extinct volcano called Arthur's Seat. It was at the time split into two distinct areas. The Old Town, which was populated largely by the impoverished of the city, and the New Town, which was being built progressively to create more upmarket housing for those higher on the social ladder of the time. Edinburgh's Old Town had existed since medieval times. Its stunning grey stone architecture juts across the landscape due to the irregular nature of Edinburgh's ground. Tiny arteries run off all of the old town's roads, creating a winding maze of dimly lit alleys, stairs and streets to traverse. All the beauty, however, belied the fact that at the time, its poor inhabitants were living amongst some of the most overcrowded and unsanitary conditions in all of Europe. The population within was largely mobile, with the inhabitants simply coming and going with work, living in squalor or one step up from squalor wherever they had an opportunity. To an outsider, it would have been a dangerous place. To the rich, it was largely regarded as no longer worth investing or living in. As the impoverished old town inhabitants struggled, the Bank of Scotland, the Royal Bank and other large business interests brought previously unheard of wealth to the upper echelons of society. With their money, the high society took to building spacious townhouses to live in within the growing new town. They ate meat and drank fine wines and had rooms to spare within their lodgings. The slum dwellers in the old town mainly lived in small shared rooms in large lodging houses, fighting over space and subsisting only on bread, dripping, tea and sugar, with little ability to regularly afford meat or vegetables. Eventually, many simply vanished from the city, gone under the gloom of the gaslit night to their next opportunity to eke out a meagre living. Edinburgh's medical profession was a key aspect of Edinburgh's illustrious reputation. In 1505, the town council had granted a charter to the incorporation of surgeons and barbers for its members to study anatomy, provided they only dissected one condemned man per year after he was dead to learn from his anatomy and to instruct others. The baton for teaching anatomy was then passed from this institution to Edinburgh University 
in the 1700s when a further allowance was made for bodies for dissection. This new limit still came with the provision that the specimens came from the same condemned men or from a new source, suicide victims. Eventually, these annual dissection limits were removed almost entirely or likely enforced to the same end to facilitate the teaching. Further relaxation of the rules enabled other bodies other than the university to dissect publicly. Organisations such as the Royal College of Surgeons and Edinburgh College of Surgeons provided extramural teaching for those not associated with any specific institution. Edinburgh's innumerable surgeons and doctors were at the forefront of enhancing the ever-growing world's knowledge of anatomy and physiology. Societal divide was clear, even here, whereby the only contribution the poor were able to make was as demonstration material for the physicians both before and after their death. This clear divide of rich and poor across all of society persisted until the enterprising spirit of the working class made strange bedfellows of some of the city's poor and a group of upper class physicians called the anatomists. The anatomists were one of the most visible aspects of medical society in 1800s Edinburgh. They wore distinguished clothing held distinguished positions within the eminent institutions of the day and were at the forefront of the ever-growing medical world's knowledge of the human body. The anatomists ran anatomy courses, which took place daily. They comprised of a full demonstration on, quote, fresh anatomical subjects of the structure of the human body, and a history of the uses of its various parts and the organs and structures generally, which will be described with a constant reference to practical medicine and surgery. The demonstrations were required as part of any budding surgeon's training requirement and were often run in multiple parts. The full course, should one attend both requisite parts, would set the trainee back £5.00 a sum equivalent to around £500 today, or slightly more than half of that sum to only attend one series of lectures. These displays led to the only real form of judgement and opposition the anatomists really received in society from the city's religious leaders, who took issue with how they treated the supposedly sacrosanct corpses of the dead. The popularity of these shows required a constant fresh flow of bodies to enable dissection, both as they were unable to keep the bodies from decaying and the volume of material which required covering. The only legal way to obtain a fresh supply of dissection material was, as the ordinance ensured, to purchase or obtain them from morgues and only if the person complied with the provision of having been a prisoner prior to their death or having committed suicide. This created obvious supply bottlenecks and corpses were always in short supply. Enterprising young men from the city's poor sensed an opportunity. It was a unique point of Scots law at the time that corpses had no legal standing providing they had not been interred. Should someone choose to remove a body from a coffin prior to burial and bring it to the care of the anatomists, they would transgress many moral and ethical boundaries, but legally they were in the clear. If the body was interred, the robber could be convicted of, quote, violation of sepulchres, but even then, if they weren't caught in the act, They were free to argue that the body had never been interred in the first place. As such, the city's dead, be they well to do, or fed from bread and dripping, soon found themselves sold to the public dissection table of the anatomists. The grave robbers were rewarded handsomely for their work. 
A body in the 1800s could fetch somewhere in the region of 5 to 10 pounds. With that in their pocket, their bread and dripping diet would give way to ale, meat and cheese. As word spread, grave robbers rose from across the have-nots of society. Everyone from groundskeepers of graveyards, amateurs and professionals alike took their turn removing bodies from their final resting place in return for payment. It was not the sole preserve of men either. Helen Torrance and Jean Waldy were two famous resurrection women who, when they failed to find a body worth taking in the graveyard, stole and killed a young child for sale to the surgeons. For their devilish handiwork, they were paid two shillings and sixpence and a dram of whisky. For their actions, they were publicly tried and sentenced to death in 1752. The descendants of Edinburgh's rich, shocked by the violation of their resting places, looked for more and more elaborate ways to protect their graves after death, and the police began to seek harsher punishments for the resurrectionists they caught. One of the most visible inventions against resurrectionists was the mort safe, a small iron cage which was placed over the top of a grave after burial to protect its dead inhabitant. Eventually, some of the most enterprising and unscrupulous individuals realised they could avoid the mort safes, the police and the middleman altogether by following the example of Helen Torrance and Jean Baldy by creating corpses all by themselves. Two particularly famous among them would give rise to the phenomenon of true crime reporting as a form of entertainment in the United Kingdom. I'm Jess and this is Skinwalker. William Burke was born in Unley County Tyrone in 1792, an area around 45 miles west of Dundalk in Ireland. His birth name was Liam de Burke, which he later anglicised to William Burke. Little is known about his early youth, however, as a teenager, he served in the army for the Donegal militia from 1809 until 1812. He spoke both Irish and English fluently, a skill undoubtedly welcomed in the occupied Ireland of the time. During his time within the Donegal militia, Burke had served briefly under the command of Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, who held the role of Chief Secretary for Ireland in 1809. He was then put under the command of the Duke's brother, William Wellesley Pole, who remained in the same role as Chief Secretary for Ireland until 1812. His company commander was a fierce man named Captain Irwin. At some point during his time in the militia, he had made his way to Bolina in County Mayo, both for medical treatment at the regimental hospital and for matrimony. He was an attractive man who was small of stature. He stood five feet and five inches tall and had brown hair with matching brown eyes. During his time in the militia, Burke sought out professional sexual services as many of his comrades did. His endeavours meant that he caught syphilis from one of the many prostitutes who followed the regiment men, an experience which was to cause him some physical pain in his later life. Burke was a man of music and a natural entertainer, either being his military division's fifer or drummer. He used his charm and skills as an entertainer to sweet-talk a local girl of good standing, Margaret Coleman, into bed. In the weeks after, it was discovered that Burke had impregnated her. To protect his duty to his Catholic faith, as well as Margaret's honour, he duly proposed and wed her. The pair moved in together 
and formed a family. Soon after, in 1818, Burke had a significant dispute with his father-in-law over land and abandoned his wife and child to head to Scotland. When work began on the Union Canal in Polmont, just outside of Falkirk, Burke signed up, sensing an opportunity to make decent money. Burke was 26 years old when his work began on the canal and stayed there until August of 1822, by which time he was now 30 and the canal had achieved practical completion. After the canal work dried up, he had to become resourceful to ensure he did not starve, a struggle known to many transient labourers of the time. He initially went to Peebles, a small village in the Scottish borders, to work as a labourer. He then worked as a weaver for 18 months and a baker for five. There was little that he was unwilling to turn his hand to in return for coin and a roof over his head. Burke had also began dating a woman named Helen McDougall in his first few months working on the Union Canal. Helen was besotted with Burke. She had been born in Stirlingshire in 1795. Helen was not a particularly clever woman, likely having received little formal schooling and had no substantial means of her own. Her surname was neither that of her birth nor of her marriage. She had simply taken up the surname of the first man with whom she had fallen in love and moved in with. The man McDougall was already married, however his wife was aware of the arrangement. McDougall sired two children with Helen. In the eyes of the law, the children were deemed illegitimate as they had been born out of wedlock. As McDougall died of typhus later, he left her little but two children and his last name. Burke, in a chance meeting with a Catholic priest from his Irish past, was informed he was to immediately return to his family in Ireland and leave Helen, or else he would be shunned by his faith. He refused to renounce Helen and was excommunicated by the church for the transgression. Afterwards, he moved from his own Catholic domain and took to attending Helen's Protestant church and was even known to perform some lay preaching in his spare time. The two travelled the country, largely in support of Burke's transient working life. After spending the summer of 1827 in Pennycook, the pair met with a former acquaintance of sorts, Margaret Hare. Margaret invited them to come to Edinburgh and to live in her lodging house. Her husband, also William, was somewhat known to Burke from his time on the Union Canal. Both had been navvies, a term at the time for manual labourers who worked on major civil engineering projects, and both were Irish Catholics. This was enough for the pair. Rather than head west, as they had intended, they set off for Margaret Hare's lodging house in central Edinburgh in late 1827. William Hare, the husband of Margaret Hare, soon became a fast friend of William Burke. He had been born in the early 1790s and was an Irish Catholic labourer who was likely born in Newry, County Down, in modern-day Northern Ireland. Newry lies around 10 miles north of Dundalk, meaning the pair unknowingly grew up around 50 miles from one another prior to meeting on the Union Canal in Scotland many years later. Hare was not a native Irish speaker, instead speaking the business language of his region of the time, English. Life in Newry, or indeed anywhere around it whereby Hare may have grown up, would have been tough for a young Irish Catholic. The upper classes were the Protestants, and they were granted power by the Englishmen who ruled over Ireland at the time, and this enabled Protestants to have relative dominion over their less wealthy and powerful Catholic neighbours. Little is known of William Hare's early life or teens. 
However, some rumours persisted of his membership in a secret agricultural society. Whatever took place in his life in Ireland, Hare eventually emigrated to Scotland, likely by way of England, in the wake of the Irish Economic Depression which followed the Battle of Waterloo. He too ended up in Pullment to assist in the digging of the Union Canal, likely arriving sometime in the late 1810s, whereby he and his wife Margaret became acquainted with William Burke and Helen McDougall. After the completion of the Union Canal, Hare found casual labour work in Port Hopeton, a working canal area which ran through central Edinburgh until its infilling in the 1920s. Early on in his time in Edinburgh, Hare met a fellow Irish emigre, Margaret Logue. Margaret was married to a man named James Logue, to whom she had a child. The pair had met when Hare had checked into the lodging house which the Logue family ran in Tanner's Close, Edinburgh. During Hare's stay, he and Logue had an almighty falling out due to Logue's discovery of an extramarital affair between Hare and Margaret. William Hare was thereafter forced to leave the lodging house. His absence proved to be only temporary though. Soon after Hare was forced to leave, James Logue died. Whether through foul play or natural causes, his exit from the earth resulted in William Hare's re-emergence on the scene for Margaret. And not only did William Hare inherit Margaret, he inherited the seven-bed lodging house at Tanner's Close and a steady, if meagre, income to boot. Soon after their marriage, Margaret bore a child to William. This did not improve his treatment of her. Margaret was described as, quote, seldom without a pair of black eyes, and more generally, of a dull, morose disposition, either when sober or intoxicated. And intoxication was assumed to be Margaret's default state. Despite enduring violence at the hands of her husband, she too was a violent woman. On one occasion, when William Hare returned home, he discovered Margaret particularly drunk. As he questioned her conduct, she threw a bucket of water over him. Burt proceeded to return the blow. Then, as the pair scuffled, Margaret got not only the last word, but the last blow. These encounters of mutual violence were commonplace between the couple. William Hare, unsurprisingly, used violence frequently. He had a reputation for being fearsome and vicious. One evening, Burke and Hare went out drinking with their respective significant others and a man named McLean. At the end of the drinking session, William Hare gathered up all of the money that everyone had grouped together in a kitty to pay their group tab and put it in his pocket. As the group looked on bewildered, Hare simply walked out. William Burke, keen to avoid a scene, went up to the barman and paid the bill out of his own pocket. As he departed the bar, McLean turned to Hare and stated what he had done. Leaving Burke to fit the bill whilst he pocketed the group's money had been cruel. William Hare launched into a vicious assault on McLean, kicking him in the face as he lay on the ground and leaving him with a burst lip. McLean at the time was an elderly gentleman, but this mattered little to William Hare. Despite Hare's violent attitude being somewhat in contrast to William Burke's more gregarious charm, the two developed a strong friendship. It may have been due to their shared Irishness in a foreign land, or it may have simply been William Burke despite his charm was a dishonourable man himself, and men such as William Hare were the sum of what he could strive for in companions. Or perhaps, being close friends with a man with a lodging house had its benefits too.
William Hare's lodging house was always full. Many of his tenants lived similarly transient lifestyles to his companion, William Burke. His door was forever being chapped, with a request to extend the rent payment, as they simply hadn't the money to pay him. For all his aggression and violence, he would often accept these debts, provided he knew the tenant well enough. Throughout November and December, one of Hare's tenants, an old man named Donald, had requested a stay on his rent payments. His debts had risen to £4 by the time he had taken particularly unwell with dropsy, a fluid disorder, in December of 1827. His illness progressed rapidly, and by mid-December, Donald was dead. Given his lifestyle and means, his debt was unlikely to be satisfied by his possessions and death. As such, Hare had an idea. He had heard stories and rumours of resurrectionists who had taken the freshly dead and the freshly dug to Edinburgh University's anatomists for their lectures. The anatomists themselves were all based around the old college including a particularly famous face in the industry called Professor Alexander Munro. He was the third Alexander Munro from his family to hold the position of Professor of Anatomy at the university. Hare knew that the location was only a half mile's walk from his house at Tanner's Close in the Westport. He didn't know how much the anatomist paid but he reasoned it would have gone some way to satisfy Donald's debt to him. Hare realised that with the weight of a grown man, he would require assistance transporting the body. To avoid suspicion, he couldn't just take Donald out of the bed either. Hare spoke at length with William Burke and eventually the pair agreed they would sell Donald's corpse to the anatomists. The pair's plan was put into action the following day. They waited until Donald's corpse was loaded into a coffin and the nails hammered down by a joiner provided by the local parish. They then took a chisel to the coffin, swapped Donald's body out for tanning bark and resealed the coffin. They then allowed the collection of the empty coffin by a local porter named John McKillock to be buried, whilst they took his corpse to be loaded into a tea crate and sold for profit. Donald's corpse was taken inside the tea crate to the Edinburgh University Medical School at the Old College by foot. Once they arrived at the Old College, they stopped there to inquire from a student the way to Professor Munro's room. The student happened to be a pupil of another famous anatomist of the time, and when he discovered their true purpose for meeting with Professor Munro, he encouraged them to go to Surgeon Square and to his own teacher, a man named Dr. Robert Knox instead. Dr. Knox's dissection rooms, he informed them, lay at number 10 Surgeon Square, and he would pay better than Munro would. Dr. Knox had trained at the University of Edinburgh himself. However, he was not a member of the established anatomy rooms of the university, instead being the lecturer for the Edinburgh College of Surgeons. A split had taken place at the time, due to the third Alexander Munro in the role being considerably worse at lecturing and much less knowledgeable about the subject matter than his forebears had been. Dr. Knox and his mentor, Dr. John Barclay, had taken the knowledge of Edinburgh University and welded it with enthusiasm for the subject and a deeper understanding than what Munro could. As numbers dwindled under Munro at the university, Dr. Knox's rooms for the Edinburgh College of Surgeons were proving so popular they required to run three classes per day on the subject to deal with the demand. When Burke and Hare arrived at Dr Knox's residence, 
they pounded loudly on the door and laid their cargo at their feet. Dr Knox himself was not present, however three of his assistants, Alexander Miller, the future Sir William Ferguson and Thomas Wharton Jones met with the pair and offering little in the way of questions, took receipt of Donald's corpse. Dr Knox then arrived from being summoned to inspect the body. As it passed muster, he authorised a payment of £7.10 shillings to the pair for their cargo, somewhere in the region of £700 in modern terms. Hare took the lion's share of £4.05, and five shillings, whilst Burt was given the remaining £3.05. And five shillings. The assistants, as they shut the door to Dr Knox's private study, noted their willingness to accept any future bodies which the pair may happen to have a need to dispose of. Getting so much money at a time when they were in a state of almost perpetual poverty prompted Burke and Hare to decide that this would be their new calling. Dr Knox too must have felt some level of excitement at the pair who had knocked on his door. Professor Monroe's lofty position within Edinburgh society and the university ensured that he had first call on all hanged men and suicide victims. Rather than having to fight over scraps from the known body snatchers, opportunity had literally just knocked on his front door. By the way, have you ever heard of Podcorn? Podcorn is a marketplace connecting podcasters to amazing podcast sponsorship opportunities such as host-read ads, interview segments and a host of others. They've not just gotten us here at Skinwalker involved with some great brands for future collaborations, but they've gone one step further and even sponsored today's episode. It's an awesome platform for both podcasters and advertisers, which reduces the hassle in getting your advertising off the ground. Podcorn care about their affiliated podcasts and they're on hand to protect you, give guidance about how to approach advertisers and how to market your podcast in a way that works for you. In terms of getting advertisers as a creator, you simply put together a small proposal for advertisers who you're interested in working with and set what you think is a fair value for your airtime. Once they accept, Podcorn puts you together in the workroom to tie together the last of the pieces. It's collaborative, but you never lose any creative control or rights to your podcast. And payment once everything is complete is super simple. For advertisers, it's just the same process from the other side of the glass. Super neat and super simple. We've put a link in the show notes for Podcorn for those of you who want to start to explore sponsorship opportunities or start monetizing your podcast. Murder came as a natural next step to the destitute pair. Soon after the nighttime venture to Dr Knox's dissecting rooms, in late January or early February of 1828, the pair murdered their first two victims. There is some dispute between Burke and Hare as to which of the murders was committed first, but given Hare's relative wit, even if it was a form of low cunning, over Burke's history may slightly favour his telling of the story. Abigail Simpson was an older woman from Gilmerton, nearby to Edinburgh. She had come to Hare's lodging house to enable her to sell salt and camstone locally in the city. She had drunk long into the night with Hare and lay in a senselessly drunk sleep. Hare suggested to Burke that they strangle her and sell her to Dr Knox. Burke, looking forward to another payment, agreed. Hare knew that Burke was a former army man and would likely have some ability in ending another's life. Hare was by his own admission somewhat of a mean-spirited hater of his fellow man, but he was not for putting himself forward to be the murderer. 
pair then devised a strategy of murder between them. Burke knew, likely through his military training, that a person could feasibly be killed, leaving little evidence of foul play, by compressing their throat tightly with the thumb and fingers and maintaining that pressure for a period. He would need no resistance to avoid defensive wounds which may raise eyebrows in the aftermath. This was where their victim's drunken incapacitation was of particular use. To minimise any further resistance, Hare would physically pin their victim by lying on their chest whilst Burke applied the agreed pressure to their throat. As the victim went into their death throes, the pair would leave them to draw their final breath without any pressure being applied. Abigail was killed and her body was provided to Dr Knox, who once again made similar payment for similar cargo. £6 went to Hare and £4 to Burke. Dr Knox remarked upon seeing Abigail's corpse that he was delighted at how fresh the body was. The method of murder the pair used was later given an epithet based on its creator and dubbed Burking. Unbeknownst to the pair, they had created a near foolproof measure against detection. Hare's weight on the victim's chest prevented full expansion of the lungs and releasing the tension on the throat prior to the death made the strangulation look like suffocation, which made the job of the detective twice as difficult in the pre-forensics era. Joe the Miller was the pair's second murder victim. He had become ill with a fever whilst lodging in Tanner's Close. His condition was not life-threatening, but he was confined to bed in his convalescence. Hare had other ideas than for his recovery. He implored Burke to enable further financial gain by simply helping Joe along the path he was already on, further arguing that having fever in the lodging house would be ill for business. This solicitation missed out one key factor. Joe was unlikely to die should they not intervene. Despite this, Burke agreed to put Joe out of his non-misery. He was duly burked and the pair took his body to Surgeon Square and the dissection room of Dr Knox once again. With little regard or inquiry as to how they had acquired the body and to satisfy the need for corpses for his anatomy shows, once again Burke and Hare received their coin, split six to Hare and four to Burke. Again, they were informed that the dissection rooms would take any and all bodies, provided they were in a displayable condition. Realising on the third visit, they were unlikely to be faced with significant questioning upon their provision of the bodies and the seemingly bottomless pockets of Dr Knox. Burke and Hare sensed their financial predicament was on course for an improvement. Margaret Hare, upon seeing the pair's swollen pockets, began a custom of demanding a further £1 share from Burke's money as a type of tax for his utilisation of her house for their deeds. What this meant in truth was that the Hares received £7 and Burke £3. A third murder victim was soon to follow, an old lady who had met with Margaret Hare by chance, was convinced to go back to the lodging house and Margaret induced her to drink to the point of stupor. She was then led to bed multiple times until she had fallen asleep. She was then suffocated by a cloth bag by Hare and sold to Dr Knox for the customary fee. The old lady's identity was never discovered and she remains one of the only victims of the pair not to have been burped. The pair had also begun to get somewhat careless, forgetting that even amongst the supposedly forgotten classes, some would nonetheless be remembered when they went missing. One such example was Mary Patterson. 
Mary was an 18-year-old prostitute living in Edinburgh. She was a known woman of the street, famed for her beauty as much as her profession. On the 9th of April, 1828, she was out in the streets with a friend called Janet Brown. The pair had been arrested for their craft the previous evening. Seeking to quench the first that their overnight jewels they had given them, they attended a local bar of sorts. Inside, William Burke charmed them with drinks and money, then invited them to a house in Gibbs Close in Edinburgh's Cannon Gate, which was owned by his brother, Constantine. Burke hid this fact from the girls, instead stating the inhabitants were his tenants and he was their wealthy landlord. Within the house, the group continued to drink. Mary passed out, but Janet stayed awake. A fight broke out between Burke and Helen McDougall, who had come to the house and discovered her common-law husband abed with two prostitutes. The disturbance did not awaken Mary. However, Janet quickly left the house, stating she would return in the evening for Mary. When she came back to the house, she was informed Mary had left with William Burke, but she was free to wait. She took a seat and awaited the return of her friend. Unknown at the time, Mary was lying dead in a room only a few feet away, awaiting the inevitability of being loaded into a tea crate and delivered to Dr Knox. Mrs Laurie, Janet's landlord, feared for Janet and sent her servant to fetch her from Gibbs Close. When the servant arrived, Janet left the house once more, although it is likely she had a close shave with being turned into another of Dr Knox's anatomy exhibits. When Mary's corpse was delivered to Dr Knox, she fetched the sum of £8. One of the assistants, seemingly aware of the body being Mary, inquired somewhat emotionally as to how they had procured the body. The reply came from her that an old woman in the cannon gate had summoned them to collect the young woman on the table in front of them, having found her dead. The assistant then stated that he knew the woman in question and that she was called Mary. This was not to be the end of the pair's questioning. Once the students were brought into the rooms, one discovered Mary's identity immediately. He declared he had been with the lady in question only three nights prior and she seemed in fit health. After asking Dr Knox who had supplied the body, the questioner waited until the next time they brought a subject to the dissection rooms. Along with two cronies, he repeatedly asked the pair where she had been found what had become of her and if she had come to foul play. Once again, the reply came that she had been sold to them on Canongate, with nothing more sinister at play. It was a believable story, but nonetheless a troublesome experience which could have led to capture for Burke and Hare. Burke and Hare learned a valuable lesson from the murder and sale of Mary. The pair established a clearer business plan for committing their murders, avoiding detection and keeping a fresh supply of bodies for Dr Knox. They would now solely pick up targets from the elderly, infirm, destitute and unnoticeable. Given tenements could house up to 48 families, and even the well-to-do made use of prostitutes. Word still spread if unusual things took place to people they were familiar with. So despite their eagerness to develop their business, they had to exercise a degree of caution to avoid detection. Their chosen targets needed to have faces which merged easily into not just the forgotten, but the ignorable of 1820s Edinburgh. These victims would mean little to the investigatory forces and not draw suspicion, even from those in the same social rung as themselves. 
They also ensured their victims were not going to be physically imposing to make their chosen manner of killing easier to execute. They would be lured in with the promise of drunkenness, parties, livery, and in the case of some women, lured by the handsome burk, flattery and flirtation. Once inside, the pair would decide whether to follow through with murder. Burke later said that they quote, had a great many pointed out for murder, but were disappointed of them by some means or other. The first victim of the new strategy from the now practiced Burke and Hare was an old feeble cinder gatherer named Effie. Burke charmed her into a stable one evening and having gotten her insensible with drink, summoned Hare. They dispatched of Effie's life and were once again ten pound richer for their troubles. The next to befall their fate to Burke and Hare was a man from Cheshire. The pair could not recall his name, but recalled he was around forty, with a brown moustache flecked with grey who had recently come to work in the area. He began to suffer jaundice whilst using a room at the lodging house and was hastened on his path towards death for the sum of £10 from Dr Knox. A further unknown victim was provided to Burke by the police themselves. As they physically accosted a particularly drunken woman in the street, Burke intervened. He stated to them he knew the woman in question and would see her home if they would let her go. They released the woman to his care, then he released her to the care of Dr Knox's dissection rooms for the customary fee. The same local insider knowledge that made choosing victims difficult was also beginning to affect the pair personally. There was some growing concern among their neighbours over rumours about the pair's actions and relationship with Dr Knox. William Hare would always diffuse this and tell them the same thing. He was a trader in bodies, taking in specimens from grave robbers and selling them to medical men, nothing more. As such, despite the fact they would never rob a grave in their lives, Burke and Hare earned themselves the label of resurrection men. The pair then lured in an elderly Irish grandmother and her disabled grandson. The lady noted she had walked a great distance to meet with some Irish friends in the city and brought her grandson along with her. He could understand what they said, but he could not talk in reply. Having gotten the grandmother drunk to the point of no return, she was dispatched by the pair in burking fashion. Her grandson was permitted to stay the night, although in the morning they realised his release in society could raise alarms. He too was killed, with Burke saying he was haunted by the young boy's petrified eyes as he learned what was to come. They were too large as a pair for the tea crate and were instead transported in a herring barrel. The two corpses fetched £16 from Dr Knox and his assistants. The activities of the pair dwindled in the summer of that year, given Burke and Helen McDougall elected to take a holiday to nearby Falkirk to spend time with some of Helen's relatives in the area. This temporary halt to their spree was entirely Burke's idea. Prior to departing, Margaret Hare had approached Burke and said that when he was away he needed to kill Helen and if he wanted they could bring her body back to sell to Dr Knox. Her rationale was that she, Burke and Hare were all of Irish stock, but Helen as a Scottish woman was not to be trusted. Burke declined her offer and instead returned to a mask of normality whilst visiting the relatives in question. The activities of the individual however continued. Burke may have set down his tools, but Hare had not. Whilst Burke was in Falkirk, Hare murdered a woman of his own accord, selling her for £8 to Dr Knox. Burke was furious with rage when he discovered that Hare had killed and sold without him. 
not because it was their shared purpose, but because he had not been paid his share thereafter. Although his pockets were now swollen with Dr. Knox's coin, they were less swollen than that of the hares, who took 70% of the takings and most of the murders. A rift between the pair formed, and Burke moved out from the lodging house to a small house within a tenement on an unnamed alleyway between Weaver's Close and Grinley's Close in Wester Portsborough, which lay west of Edinburgh's grass market. The fallout was not final to their partnership. When Anne McDougall, a cousin of Helen's who had been invited through on the recent trip to Falkirk, arrived in Edinburgh, the pair once again sensed opportunity. Having gotten her drunk, she was murdered and sold to Dr Knox, whose fee had once again returned to £10, although whether the split in proceeds had changed, Burke did not disclose. It seemed for the pair, nothing ran thicker than money. A further unnamed murder and sale was committed on an older cleaner who occupied a free room in the house. Her body fetched only £8 from Dr Knox, however Burke and Hare delighted in the fact that after her death they were able to remove a further nine and a half pence from her person. Mary Holden and her daughter Peggy were two further victims of the pair, although their chronology is rather more difficult to place as neither of the pair were ever able to recall exactly when their murder took place. Both Mary and Peggy were prostitutes. Mary had taken lodgings at Hare's lodging house and one day, whilst out a walk, was discovered in the nearby grass market, in his words, quote, sober and sorry for it. As such, he offered her free drink in return for her companionship. Joined by Burke, the pair began to drink. Eventually, Mary had become so overwhelmed she lay for a sleeping straw in Hale's establishment. She was never to wake and was delivered to Knox for the £10 sum. Peggy grew alarmed over the coming days. She began asking around and when a local shopkeeper noted that he had seen her mother with Burke and Hare, she attended the lodging house. Margaret Hare in a rage, demanded to know who she thought she was to darken their door with her poor reputation, or why someone such as her mother, with equally bleak regard, would be allowed inside either. William Hare, however, summoned Peggy in. He noted to her that her mother had indeed stopped by, but had since left for Mid Calder, another area in Edinburgh. He offered her a drink as a welcome guest. She was further welcomed into unconsciousness, then a tea crate, then to Dr Knox's dissection rooms. Her value was again set by Dr Knox at £10. October 1828 spelled the beginning of the end for Burke and Hare. The pair witlessly targeted a local boy, aged only 18, named Daft Jamie Wilson. History was less forgiving of the less ordinary, and as such, Daft Jamie was the nickname given to Westport's village idiot. Daft in Scots at the time meant soft, taken to mean he was soft in the head. He typically entertained children, or was attacked by them, depending on how the day had went, and had a limp as a result of his deformed foot. As a result of his status, he was at the very least well known within the community, a factor which went against the entire business model, grisly as it was, of Burke and Hare's partnership. Margaret Hare had brought Jamie to the lodging house, aiming to supply her husband's business venture with a fresh target. When she arrived, none of the pair were in the lodging house. However, Burke had noticed Margaret heading to the house with the boy. She then appeared in the small pub, loudly declared that Burke was to quote, buy her a dram, then stood on his foot as the pair drank. The subtle cue gave Burke all the implication he needed. He finished his drink and accompanied Margaret back to the house. 
One newspaper later noted that Mrs. Hare led poor Jamie in as a dumb lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep to the shearers. It seems unlikely that Margaret was unaware that the public story that her husband and William Burke were just reboxing freshly dug bodies was a fabrication. Jamie was then gotten as drunk as possible before being forcibly thrown down and held by the pair. He had his mouth, nose and throat compressed until he was suffocated in the burking fashion. Despite them being two to his one, Jamie fought every inch of the way and very nearly prevented the pair from being able to finish their deed. When Jamie was eventually overcome, his corpse was again sold to Dr Knox and displayed for dissection. Several local students identified him instantly, prompting a protestation from Dr Knox that it was not the same man. To avoid any further discussion on the matter, Knox began the lecture by dissecting the exhibit's face. The exhibit was, of course, as the students had established it to be, Jamie Wilson. After the murder, Burke gave much of the clothing taken from Jamie Wilson to his nephews, the son of his brother Constantine. The discovery of the clothing within their possessions would later be another string in the bow for the prosecution at Burke's trial. The physical act of giving these clothes that would inevitably be linked to the crime if someone were to look hard enough shows that the pair were unlikely to be criminal masterminds who had discovered a way to game the system through murder and were more likely incredibly fortunate madmen who, for a time, made murder a very well-paid profession. The final nail in the coffin for the partnership of Burke and Hare was hammered on Friday, October 31, 1828, with the murder of Mary Doherty. Mary Doherty, who went by the name of Madge or Madgie, was a small Irish woman from Donegal. She was married to a man named Campbell back home, although she was particular in when she used his British sounding surname and her own Irish sounding surname. She spoke English, however her native tongue was the Irish of her motherland. She was somewhere between 40 and 50 and had recently been living in Glasgow. On Thursday, October 30, 1828, Mary arrived in Edinburgh in search of her son, Michael Campbell. Michael had arrived to work in the harvest and had been in the city for around two months, lodging with a couple near Pleasance, an area of the city where many lodging houses for such transient workers existed. However, when Mary went to the lodging house to see him, she found out that he had left a few days previously and the pair were unable to meet. Interestingly, Mary used the more Scots-sounding Campbell as her name when she checked in. Mary then stayed overnight in the same lodging house as her son had been staying. The following day, October 31 of 1828, Mary set off to inquire after her son with several people she knew he was friendly with. None were able to provide her with any information which was to be of any use in locating Michael, so Mary set off on her own to the Irish district of the old town, hoping to find him. Once Mary had arrived in the Westport, home to many of the city's Irish diaspora, she had reverted to Doherty. And as fate would have it, the handsome and kindly shoemaker she struck up a conversation with was an Irish Doherty too. He invited Mary to take the burden off her feet and the grumble from her belly at his house where his wife Helen was waiting. He even mentioned a party he knew of that evening to which she was more than welcome. Mary, in accepting all of the invitations thrown her way, was not to know that William Burke may have been an Irishman, but he was no Doherty, and that he had less than kindly plans for her in mind. Mary accompanied Burke back to his tenement flat in the maze of alleyways, and when she arrived, 
She was supplied with porridge and milk, which she lapped up by the fire of the flat in the early afternoon. After this, the group took to drinking. By the early evening, Mary was already rather drunk. She mentioned to a neighbour of Bucks, Anne Conway, that she was going to head out to St Mary's Wind to try and chase down another lead for her son. Anne cautioned her against it, noting that the area was a maze to an outsider and if she left, she were unlikely to find the place again in a hurry, especially given she had been drinking. She might even have gotten arrested, given the police weren't awfully fond of drunks in the street. This quelled Mary's desire to go outside and she instead took to enjoying the drink on offer and the companionship of those at the party. Burke demanded that Anne Gray, a relative of Helen McDougall's who stayed in a spare room of the flat, leave for the evening and stay at the Hare's lodging house in Tanner's Close. She protested, but eventually she relented and went the short distance to Tanner's Close with her husband and child in tow. Anne later remarked that she felt she was being removed as she was not Irish enough for the party. However, it was something far less mundane and much more sinister which William Burke had in mind. William Hare and his wife Margaret were the final party guests to join, having went to seek David Patterson one of Dr Knox's assistants about a potential corpse they would be able to put his way. Mr Patterson was not in, so they instead headed to Burke's house. The guests were sharing a bottle of spirits and the house itself was jumping. Anne Conway headed to bed whilst the others carried on without her. Eventually, around 11pm, Burke and Hare came to drunken blows and a cry rose up heard by the neighbours of murder. A neighbour fetched the police to investigate, however it was played off as a simple fist fight with an overreacting witness in Mary. They claimed Mary had just been overcome with emotion and drink and cried out. The police accepted their statement and headed off back into the night. By this point, Mary had already been strangled to death in the customary burking way and had her body hidden under straw at the end of the house's beds. At midnight, Burke once again went to call on David Patterson. This time he attended the house. Remarking how difficult a place it was to find, Burke, the Hares and Helen McDougall pushed him to take the corpse away that moment although he remarked he was unable to assess it in the dark and had no porter. As he left, he mentioned he would send someone round in the morning to arrange the collection of what he assumed to be a stolen corpse. The Conways then arose at 3am on November 1 to begin their day, unaware of what had taken place. Anne Gray, after returning the following morning, inquired after Mary. Helen McDougall claimed that she had been put out of the house for being too raucously drunk and being flirtatious with her husband. The answer seemed to satisfy another man in the house by the name of Brogan, but did not quell Mrs Gray's curiosity. She began to search the property. Anne Gray found the naked and dead body of Mary Doherty facing the wall haphazardly hidden under the straw. She alerted her husband, James, and the pair left the house in haste. Helen McDougall shouted after them. They could not prove a thing, then offered a further witness at the scene £4 per week should she be able to keep a secret. The departing greys apparently remarked to their relative Helen, Good God, how could you do it? The Greys went to the police station at Fountain Bridge, which was around half a mile away, to make their report. Upon the police's attendance, there was nobody within the dwelling. In the time that it had taken the Greys to make their report, Burke and Hare had once again spirited a body to Surgeon Square for Dr Knox. To enable this, they had sought the help of John McCulloch after the Greys left. McCulloch was a porter 
who had taken numerous bodies for Burke and Tear up to Dr Knox's dissecting rooms previously, and once again he was presented with a tea crate and off he went. Helen and Margaret had went to Knox's home address in the new town to collect their payment, however he was not fond of having their type at his home address and directed them to speak with David Patterson. Patterson later attended a pub the group were in, paying Burke and Hare £4.14 and shillings between them and 5 shillings to McCulloch for his porterage. They were promised a further £5 would be paid come the following week. As luck would have it for the police, the party returned just as they were planning to search the flat. When they investigated, Mary Doherty's body was nowhere to be seen, although there were several fresh blood spots in the bedroom which she had been stored. Due to differences in the party's testimony, they asked Burke, Hare and their partners to accompany them to the station for further questioning. A neighbour noted to the police that he had seen the porter, McCulloch, coming down the stairs with a tea crate filled with straw. John Fisher, who worked for the Fountain Bridge Police, sensed something at work and set to questioning John McCulloch as to where he deposited his cargo. The following morning of Monday November 2, a search was initiated at Dr Knox's dissection rooms. One of the bodies in the cool room at Surgeon's Square was positively identified by James Gray as that of Mary Doherty. She would be the only body related to Burke and Hare which the police would ever formally identify and recover. After Mary's body was recovered, the Hares, William Burke and Helen McDougall were all arrested on presumption of murder. Throughout November, the police undertook intense examination of the suspects. Given there were no significant laws against the methods which the police could use to extract a confession, the four were likely subjected to rather intense investigation methods. However, there was little to go on. Given that Burking left only a dubious hint of murder on its victim, the Crown was relying on the police getting a statement to ensure they had any chance of achieving a conviction. As such, on December 1, 1828, William and Margaret Hare were offered immunity from prosecution should they turn King's evidence against William Burke and Helen McDougall. Much has been made of the fact that Margaret Hare seemed to be cunning enough to have negotiated such a deal, and whilst this may be true, the fact that Margaret and William Hare had a formal marriage, as opposed to Burke and McDougall's common law marriage, likely helped, given that true spouses cannot be compelled to give evidence against one another. Considering this, by December 8, an amended indictment was drawn up to prosecute Burke and McDougall for the murder of Mary Doherty, Mary Patterson and Jamie Wilson. The trial was to be held in front of four judges and a jury of their peers. The judges presiding were Lord Pitmilly, Lord Meadowbank, Lord Mackenzie and the Lord Justice Clerk. Lord Advocate Sir William Ray led the prosecution for the trial. Patrick Robertson was called to defend William Burke, while Helen McDougall's defence was being led by Henry Coburn. The trial began at 10.15am on Christmas Eve of 1828. In a somewhat unusual fashion for our modern experiences, the trial carried on through the night until Christmas morning itself as five statements from the accused, a number of points of interest and the testimony of 53 witnesses was heard. There were no significant breaks or recesses and the trial continued until the jury was ready to make its decision. As the trial began, the defence counsel immediately challenged the fact that William Burke was being tried on three unconnected murders 
from various locations on one charge sheet. Similarly, Helen McDougall stood accused of only one murder, yet was co-accused on the same indictment which contained three murders for William Burke. As such, Sir William Ray accepted the formatting of the charge sheet was incorrect and the trial proceeded focused only on one charge, that of the murder of Mary Doherty. William Hare supplied intimate details about the commission of the crimes in question and the attendees at Burke's tenement were all the prosecution needed, although there was no shortage of witnesses brought forth. As such, Burke was convicted of the murder of Mary Doherty and sentenced to death. Helen McDougall was found not proven on the same evidence, a unique Scots law perspective which neither declares the accused as guilty or innocent. It instead is supposed to be interpreted as there exists the potential for a conviction, but the prosecution has not led the evidence in such a way to pass the criminal law conviction threshold of being guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. Burke, in the lead up to his execution, was interviewed by Sir Robert Christison with his account as well as the testimony of Hare and the various parties on the witness stand over 24th and 25th of December forming much of the known facts around the murders he admitted that the torture of his career in murder had led to severe insomnia which he had sought to counteract by consuming copious amounts of alcohol and up to a pint of opium a day to try and obtain sleep. Burke confessed three times in total, officially on January 3rd, then again to the Edinburgh Evening Current on January 21 and a further reaffirmation of the January 3rd confession on the 22nd of January. Burke was executed by hanging on January 28, 1829 at Edinburgh's Lawn Market in front of a packed crowd of 25,000 people. The current was not allowed to publish until February 7th, whereby Hare had already left the country and Burke had been hanged until his death. His body, in a cruel twist of fate, was dissected by Professor Knox's main rival, Professor Alexander Munro at Edinburgh University. Between January 29 and January 30, over 30,000 keen-eyed students took in a viewing of Burke's dissected body. It is also alleged that numerous high society members took pieces of Burke's skin as trophies. The pair had replicas of their busts created, with hairs being cast during the trial and Burke's after his execution. They were paraded as evidence of phrenology the supposed science of the ways in which cranial capacity affected behaviour. Now an entirely discounted mode of science, many lecturers of the time nonetheless made a living explaining the varying ways in which Burke and Hare's physical anatomy and racial background ensured they would behave in the ways in which they did. After the trial and the creation of his bust, Hare was smuggled to England for his own safety. The family of Jamie Wilson applied to prosecute William Hare privately in February of 1829. Private prosecution is a Scots law application which can be made to try a case without the support of the public prosecutor. Their application was ultimately unsuccessful. Helen MacDougall too was spirited away to England. She subsequently betrayed her true identity in every area she was ever hidden in and records state she was most likely severely injured by lynching or stoning in Gates Head after admitting once again to being the Helen McDougall of Burke and Hare fame. She is reported to have even went to the Westport directly after the trial had finished, almost being killed due to her association with the murderous pair. Margaret Hare left her husband and went back to her native Ulster once the dust had settled on the trial of William Burke and Helen MacDougall. After this, 
the remaining trio of the grisly history are lost to history. One place in which the pair have remained alive is in print and on screen. It has been argued that the case of Burke and Hare gave rise to true crime reporting as a widespread phenomenon enjoyed by the public. The Newgate Calendar, which bore the subtitle The Malefactor's Bloody Register, was an annual collection of biographies for British miscreants and criminals. It had originally been a monthly bulletin of hangings, however in the late 1700s it had switched to its more entertainment based model. The most famous of its biographies belongs to William Burke. His own contribution to the Newgate calendar was widely and cheaply circulated in broadsheet form for consumption by the public who could not afford the collection. Similar publications sprung up, all focused on the same man. The popularity of the story had a huge impact, being cited as an influence on the reporting within the Jack the Ripper case nearly 50 years later. The case also had a huge impact on Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the Edinburgh author of Sherlock Holmes' renown. Doyle was a keen admirer and student of the history of the Burke and Hare story. Characters based on Burke have appeared in at least three Holmes stories. The Resident Patient, The Disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax and Epilogue. More recently, and far less seriously, a dark comedy was loosely based on the facts by Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. The story of Burke and Hare, as it is often told, largely focuses on the two men firmly in focus and almost without fail leaves out one critical element. A critical element who avoids the stain of association better than any other close associate of the pair, the famed anatomist Dr Knox. Dr Knox was defended by both Burke and Hare at trial with both stating he was blissfully unaware of their work, save for them providing, quote, nice fresh bodies. However, his presence hangs over the entire story in a fashion William Roughhead later described as sinister. Even according to later commentary from his own guild, the Royal College of Surgeons, Dr Knox held the lofty position in his field due to a mixture of two things, his abilities as a speaker and lecturer, and the fact that he seemed to have a boundless supply of test material compared to that of his rivals. His wish to have his dissection room busy with fresh test material completely outweighed any desire he had to question his suppliers. Dr Knox was also a believer in racialism, which was a term at the time for the supposed scientific teachings of what later came to be widely known through Nazi Germany as eugenics. Dr Knox believed in racial subdivision influencing behaviour. He believed that white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were the supreme position within the white race and of the greatest character and esteem. The Catholic Irish, who were supplying him the dissection material were, in his eyes, lowly creatures prone to violence and drunkenness. The corpses they were supplying came from similar backgrounds. Perhaps, even if Dr Knox was aware of the nature of Burke and Hare's partnership, he decided that it was just in the nature of such people, and if he could get a benefit from their criminality, why should he not profit? Or perhaps, He thought people of such standing would be incapable of coming up with such an idea on their own accord. Or perhaps he just didn't care for the fate of those who had been brought to him as a result of where they were from. Proof of the thinking of the time came from the Caledonian Mercury. After the events, the Mercury published an article which framed Dr Knox as the man who had suggested the pair utilise strangulation to minimise the risk of being found to have been murdering their victims. 
whilst casting doubt on Knox's character. Even for them, it was deemed impossible that two Irish labourers would have the wherewithal to come up with a clever method of dispatching victims and creating an economic opportunity at the same time. To them, it was only possible that someone of a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant background would be capable of coming up with such information and the man would have to be Dr Knox. Given Burke's history within the Irish army, it is more than likely that he would have been aware strangulation resulted in a quick death. If he had experience of having done it in his youth, there is every chance he would know that it would not necessarily bear the hallmarks of murder, at least to the investigators of the time. Even in their judgement of the most sinister of acts, the halves of society found a way to minimise the low cunning of the offenders. Dr Knox refused to testify at trial and did not open his books to the prosecution to enable them to further enhance the details surrounding the Burke and Hare murders. This may have saved him from imprisonment, but did little for his reputation. He was hanged in effigy by members of the public in Edinburgh, but never prosecuted. His professional reputation was destroyed by his association with the pair, and he was forced to leave the city. He died in London in 1862.